Hello and welcome. I'm Philip. Good morning or maybe good evening. I don't know where you are. Um, for me, at least, it's kind of early morning. Uh, but let's see how we can work through scaling distributed teams. And by the way, time zones is one of the tricky things in distributed teams. So you need to get used to that. So I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Beats. Maybe you have heard of our products. My title is Developer Advocate, so I mostly talk about like the good stuff that we do or some experiences that we have. And one of the experiences that we have is scaling in a distributed fashion, not just for the products, but also for us as a company or as a team. So by now, we are, I think, more than 2000, but it's kind of hard to keep track because it changes quite dynamically. The company was only founded in 2000. 12, so less than eight years ago, and it has grown quite rapidly, kind of like slowly and organically in the beginning. And then we entered this phase of hyper growth and we got to this like fully distributed or work from anywhere model right from the start, because even the four founders were not in the same city back in 2012. So they already kind of set the foundational work of working in a distributed fashion and to be honest, this is much easier to get started with if you have that from the beginning rather than trying to add it later on. But of course, you can add that company later on as well. But I want to focus mostly on the scaling aspect here today, not just how to get started with distributed teams, but mostly on how to make it scale, because that seems to be one of the trickier parts. Many companies work, I mean, right now, firstly, from home. But even before, many companies were working in a distributed fashion, but not at this scale. By the way, we prefer the term distributed, like our systems, and not remote, because remote would always mean you have this one central place or hub, and then you have remote people connecting to that. But since we don't really have this one central hub, we prefer distributed. There's, so there is not one single point to start from, because there really isn't. Um, in terms of numbers, I tried to pull them. I think these are more or less accurate. Maybe they are slightly higher. So we have quite a few countries that we span. We have lots of languages and we also have many time zones. And like I already mentioned, time zones are one of the pain points that definitely happen in a fully distributed company because coordinating two continents, for example, is doable and workable. But as soon as you try to span the entire world, somebody will suffer. There are many amazing benefits to being fully distributed, but time zones are one of the trickier ones and not so upside-y things that you could have. So let's jump into how to make this work. The first thing for, I guess, any distributed team is you should have trusted adults. So micromanagement and maybe counting assets in seats in the office these are things that are just not doable anymore. So there needs to be a base level of trust and people need to kind of accept that, well, I don't see you work. You're also not maybe reachable all the time, but I trust that you do the right thing, both for yourself, because you're responsible for the outcomes and also in the interest of the company. And most of the time, people really work well in that environment because they see the trust. There will be outliers, but let's focus on the, the good side and you can always kind of adjust if something goes wrong. Um, generally, results beat time. So what is not so relevant is working nine to five. If you get amazing results and you only work five hours a day, good for you. Probably many will work way more anyway. And kind of like one of the experiences that we have is that Managers are sometimes, at least in the classic companies that I see, kind of worried that people will not work enough when they're working from home because they might do the laundry or the dishes at some point. But this is actually not the point. Like if you're productive, do the dishes whenever you feel like because that might be a good break. Also, most people actually work more, not less, because, well, they can work at any point in time and whenever they want. So. Mostly focus on the results rather than the time, because that will be one of the winning formulas. Also, 
asynchronous communication generally beats synchronous one. Once you're fully distributed and you don't have this one place where you are all at the same time and place, embrace kind of the advantages of being asynchronous. So asynchronous means mostly from an open source ecosystem is like pull requests, for example. Somebody works on some feature or refactoring and when they're done, they open a pull request. And there is no synchronous communication around that. People will review and comment on that in an asynchronous fashion. Yes, it might take a day or so until everybody gets to that just in terms of time zones. But then you can just pick up whenever the others are ready. And you're not really blocked by others, but you need to make sure that the way you work is mostly work or kind of like structured around being asynchronous and not depending on others being around to answer immediately. Otherwise, you just add a lot of buffer and blocker to your workday. So if you can, asynchronous is always preferable. Sometimes synchronous is, of course, required. If you want to have a call and we'll get to meetings a bit later, those are synchronous and you will have them and they have their place. But if you can, strive, strive for asynchronous asynchronous behaviors or events, because they will allow you also to scale much more easily. Next up, writing beats telling. And that is another point in scaling. If you rapidly onboard many people and you also have different time zones, having something written down and somebody else can onboard and find that is much more scalable than having somebody to tell or teach over and over again especially when you have, let's say, 100 new people joining every month or every other month, then having to tell them the same things over and over again probably won't work that well. But if things are written down and you have like a good onboarding guideline that everybody can walk through and kind of like a worksheet for onboarding that everybody can run through, those are all things that will scale much better than having somebody to tell like, okay, Today you do this, tomorrow you do that. Obviously you want to have the telling and interaction factor with, for example, a mentor when you onboard people, but it shouldn't be that you need to be told something over and over again to new people. Next up, communicate intentionally. When you kind of sit at home, you think communication is maybe not that important anymore, but actually communication is, I would say almost more important because you don't happen to end up in that one office and then people just talk naturally but you need to kind of like focus and make sure that the right information gets shared probably more widely than you think because ideally communication is open and people can pick up what they need but at the same time don't overwhelm everybody else with communicating so like I said, asynchronous written that will scale much better than having everything in synchronous meetings where you tell something. But spend time intentionally to communicate what you're doing and what you're working on. For example, we have often weekly status emails and we do them very intentionally because we don't see our colleagues. We might not know what they're doing, but having this weekly reference point of what have people been working on and what will they be doing next? kind of creates that sense of being a team because you're still a team. You're not just single people fighting on their own, um, but communicate intentionally and clearly. Also, I already mentioned onboarding. What we have is called XCOM based on the Marvel comics is whenever you join the company, we batch people together and fly them out to our American headquarters in Mountain View. And then you spend one week of onboarding and onboarding is not so much, for example, the technical side, but it's more about the process of how we work together and how we approach things and to have your peers as well. So you will then know, depending on when you start, 50 to 100 or so people in person that start with you and they're kind of like your initial network, people you already know across all the different functions that we have. So this is your initial network and your personal connection. And then you can build on top of that and go out into the wider plastic ecosystem from there. Also, in-person meetings are still key and required. Normally we have 
a global event we call Global All Hands, where everybody comes together once a year. Um, this year in May, we had to cancel it. So it, it will be video, so it's kind of meetings still, but unfortunately it's not because of the situation in person. But last year, for example, we had 1,000, I don't know how many people um, meeting in Florida and getting together for a week, discussing work topics, but also doing fun events and just doing this personal relationship, which is still a key point. And then for the rest of the year, we just go wherever we are or want to be um, and still build on that connection. So meeting in person once or twice a year still is an important ingredient in there and still keeps everything together, even though that one week will be pretty crazy when everybody meets once um, a year and then tries to go through all the things that you would normally do in an entire year. Next up, meetings. Everybody's favorite. Um, first off, as anywhere else, anything that can be an email should be an email, A, because it scales better and probably it's more time efficient. Also, if some meeting doesn't have an agenda or a fixed set of people who will be joining, it can just be moved over to a meeting. So we try to avoid any meetings um, unless you have like something that is set up especially or explicitly as a social event, like for example, you have a coffee hour, then you probably don't have an agenda. But for other work related meetings where you are striving for some outcome, always have an agenda. Otherwise, those won't happen. And otherwise you're kind of like stuck in this never ending march of meetings where nothing happens. Um, so be intentional about meetings. Um, for meetings, we have, I would say like three different groups that we do. First, you have one on ones. So this might be you have a weekly or bi weekly call with your manager um, just to check in how are you doing? How is your progress? What is working? What is not working? Um, those will happen. Then you probably have or we always have team calls. Um, team calls, depending on the team size, could be 10, 20, 50, or sometimes the team structure is with uh, like 100 people. Um, depending on the size, it's either more interactive or more on the broadcasting side where somebody will present something and the others get that information. I know that some people say like meetings with more than five people are useless because not everybody can speak anymore. And only kind of the loud mouths will take over and everybody else will be drowned out. I think that just needs kind of like the right attitude and discipline that everybody who wants to can speak. And also it's still important to see the mimic and the tone how somebody says something or presents it. Um, there is a lot of non or communication that is not or lost in writing. And when you see somebody speak, you get lots of little cues around that. So, after those meetings and always turn on your camera. That's another thing. Whenever you can, you should have your camera on just because otherwise you might lose a lot of information in the discussion. So those bigger meetings for us still happen and make sense. Don't have them all day long, but they do make sense with the right discipline. And then we have more broadcasting like events. This might be events for everybody in the company. And we have events with more than a thousand attendees. This is like when the CEO makes an announcement or we also do AMAs where just the CEO, for example, is running through the AMA, but everybody can write a question up front and then you still have live chat. And even though only a couple of people will be speaking on them, everybody can interact in chat, for example. So you still keep that interactive feeling to those meetings, even if you're way too big for an actual in-person meeting or general discussion. Management is also key for the overall health and sanity of everybody. We are pretty focused on having weekly or bi-weekly calls with your managers and then also quarterly reviews just to keep that feedback cycle going. And those are always backed by a document, a shared document normally, where you can throw in what are the questions that I have or what are the questions that your manager has. And then there will be a section on this is things that has been discussed and these are the follow ups or two those for both sides just to stay in the loop and also see a year later what happened in the last year. What were the review points? What was working back then? What was the plan? What is working now? Obviously, you adjust the plan as you go along. Um, 
but just to keep that flow and keep everything moving forward and hopefully in the right direction. We try to have managers with five to 10 people, which doesn't always work out because sometimes you are short on managers and then somebody has to manage more people. But I think the ideal number would be somewhere around that. Some people are very strict and then say like you cannot manage more than five people and still get anything done. Um, other managers are, I don't know, maybe have a slightly le more relaxed approach and are happy to mentor more than 10 people. But there will be a rather low number of how many people you can manage. And once you reach then a thousand to two thousand people in the company, as everybody, every manager needs another manager, you can do the math of how many people you will need kind of like to keep the structure working and how many individuals you can have to keep working. And while I think up until a couple of or dozens and then when we had only a few hundred people, we needed far fewer managers. At some point, just to keep this structure going, you will need more people working on the coordination with other teams, within the team, etc. So management is not a bad thing and it has to happen at some point to keep that scale. Um, if you only have a thousand or two thousand individuals um, who cannot really hand over to somebody else and then let them make the syncing and coordination between teams, it will probably be very hard to get anywhere. Um, we have built in a development constitution, which is an interesting document, also guiding like how do we, we approach features like maybe what, what get, gets merged, how, how do we um, approach conflicts, what about quality versus shipping speed, etc. We don't have time to go through all of them and it's actually a very well written document, so if you have any time, uh, I highly recommend reading that it's on GitHub. The link is here and it kind of shows how we try to approach problems and also how what we have learned from the past of what not to do in terms of the software engineering process. Um, one thing that we're kind of big on is we have leads for products and those are always a group of three different leads. Basically, you have a tech lead for the technical points. You have team lead more for the people side, which is mostly hiring and happiness and where do people want to grow and develop. And then we have product as well. We used to have product as a dedicated team, but in the end that didn't really make sense or first created an unnecessary boundary. So for us, a product is ingrained into the engineering teams and every team is led or has these three different groups and roles of leaders that work together on working out what will happen next, who will be hired, what technical challenge are there and how to overcome them, etc. Responsibility wise, there is always one person being responsible. Obviously that one person can delegate what they are or what is needed, but there should always be a single person responsible for something. Otherwise, nobody is responsible and it's always the other one or I thought we would do this otherwise. There should always be one person to have the last say and see what is going on in a project and drive that. That's one of the principles there. Also, we are very big on the so-called release train. Since we have many different products, many different teams, um, many developers, you cannot normally hold the development process for one little feature or so. So we try not to micromanage, will this go into this release train or not? There is a feature phrase. If the feature is ready to be merged, merge it. If it's not ready by the feature freeze, it will go on the next release. And that is the feature train or release train that keeps moving forward. And it's just like every two months or so we have a minor release. And whatever is ready should go into that release. And if it's not ready, it shouldn't hold up the release process because otherwise it's always like, okay, let's wait two more days and then everybody else is blocked. Let's wait two more days until something is finished. Um, and that will just make releases much slower. So we're very strict on that release train. And the only constant in a very fast growing company is change. So I am in the fifth team structure or so, and that is okay. Don't be afraid of it. Change is okay. Sometimes it's weird, but normally it works out fine. So change is inevitable if you grow quickly. And with that, I think we're pretty much 
exactly down to 20 minutes. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Otherwise, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, on the QR code, you can get the slides right now, or I will tweet them out. You can have my Twitter handle there um, right after that as well. And I can see somebody is typing and I will get the, either a question or that there are no questions. Give me one second. Okay, so we don't seem to have questions. So thanks everybody for joining, maybe evening or morning, wherever you are. If you have more questions on Teams, just ping me and thanks a lot for watching. Bye.